Yeah, I've been around with uh, computers for quite a while and uh, we were using punch cards because that was the only way to get information into a computer. Uh, I remember when we had uh, the, the teleprinters come out and you could type something in and you see it printed in front of you. That was a major step forward. So yes, there has been a lot of change that's gone on in the industry over that time. But uh, speaking of uh, change, uh, I'll take a completely different tack to start with. Uh, we've done a, Beth and I have done a, quite a bit of uh, work over uh, in the Pacific Islands and uh, there's one story over in Vanuatu that I will always remember for as long as uh, I'm alive. Uh, they've got lots of plantations there and the boss gave one of the locals a new car. They call them trucks. Whatever it is, it's got four wheels and doors, it's a truck. And he said, go, take it out on the plantation, it's brand new, you won't have any problems with it. Lunchtime comes, he comes back to the boss, walking into the door, says, oh boss, truck, give me brock, give me brock. And the boss, can't be, it's brand new. He says, me brock, give me brock. So the boss goes over to where it was, he lifts the bonnet up, can't find any problem there, gets inside, can't see any problem, turn the ignition on, and the fuel gauge is right over on empty. And he hauls him over and says, look at that, it's on empty. He looked at him, empty, E, I thought E stood for enough. And the boss said, if you thought E stood for enough, what do you think F meant? Finish? <laughs> the reason that I bring that story up is because when we're confronted with new situations and new technologies, we can jump to the same sorts of conclusions. And I've seen a lot of those same sorts of you know, E for enough type conclusions with the cloud based on limited information not having the full story, just having a little bit about it and then rolling on from there. And the reason that people tend to do that a lot is because there are so many aspects in the cloud which are similar to what you're already doing. So it's easy to jump to a conclusion and say that. Because in the uh, language of the uh, Pacific, E did mean enough. And they're just going with current technology. Oh, they current understanding. Well, what I really want to... I left one of my props behind. Yep. Yep. Uh, what I really want to, t to talk about getting a better understanding of what's going on with the cloud is really very simple. It's only the computing resources that you normally have, but a bit further away from you. Best going to uh, bring the, uh, a motherboard out of an old computer is, is really old. And when we pull it out, the chip the CPU chip is about that big. The currently, the, those chips are being created using 14 nanometer technology. In other words, the lines that they use to draw the transistors and circuitry in it are just 14 nanometers in width, which is just a number. But when we uh, scale that up, we take that 14 nanometer line to be the width of a pencil line. You know the ones that you wrote to get here? Then this chip, wait for it, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Thank you, dear. What would I do without my wife? Just so you can see, it really is off a motherboard. There's the CPU. Now if we blow that up, scale that up, so that the 14 nanometer lines inside that are the size of a pencil line, that chip becomes a square 17 kilometers wide. And if we were to put that on a map, that's what it would look like. In other words, that would stretch for, from where we are now down to Sunnybank and to the west, the other side of the gap. So when we're dealing with these sorts of uh, issues in there, just the fact that we can already see this from a computer's digital technology point of view, we are already remote from the workings of it. And when we're talking about the cloud, we think that we're far away from the computer, but we are not really from a technical point of view because we're already light years away from it when we're talking about digital scales. The real difference is that we can't see the computer, we don't own the computer. And that's 
where the differences come into play, not with the technology. There is nothing wrong with that. And when we're dealing with the days of punch cards, we actually had the identical principles into play then with the mainframes, because nobody ever saw the mainframe. But we still dealt with it. But who's got a mobile phone? You are already dealing with cloud technology. So when you make the call, it's being routed by some computer in some exchange somewhere. Have you ever seen that computer? I have, I've seen them. They've got rooms bigger than this with these computers sitting at just about the size of those tables in there. They have all the old technology is ripped out and these, they can have cricket games in there. But the cloud technology is already there. You've got a credit card, you're relying on cloud technology. You booked an airline ticket, cloud technology. Uh, the e-tolls that you use when you go over the gateway and all that here, that is all cloud technology. So what I'm trying to say is the cloud technology is already here. We just don't realise always that it's where it is. But what I'm going to give you to help you understand the definition of cloud is any computing resource that you access using the internet. And if you understand that, it takes a lot of the mystery out because the cloud is really just marketing terminology and marketing hype. It's nothing fancy. It is just a reincarnation of the mainframe philosophies using the internet as a way to get to the computer through there. So when you understand that, that suddenly makes that a lot easier to understand where you're going with the cloud. There are a few things which need to go into the cloud. What sort of technologies do we have there? Well, I've called this the three R's. The first group of technology are things that you already know, but they just relocated from where you are and put into the cloud somewhere else. So there's no actual change in what they're doing, but you don't have to own them. You don't have to sort them out. You don't have to worry about the maintenance of them. They are just there. And the advantages of putting that into the cloud is that you have increased accessibility because they're not on your physical premises you have access to them anywhere that you have access to the internet. So you don't have to go get into your premises to get your files down. You go off to a customer place somewhere, you realise there's a file that you need that you didn't know about, you're not dead in the water. You can make your connection and get to it. There's economies of scale. Just go look up uh, Google Data Centre and you'll see they just have rows and rows covering football fields uh, of racks with computers. And each of these racks, they're about that thin, they probably, each one of them have got 10 one terabyte disks in each of them. They just go on forever. Now when they do that, they just get these economies of scale, which means that the unit cost of ownership is a lot cheaper. So that way, you can go and buy these computing resources over the cloud, and can rent them over the cloud, in many cases, a lot cheaper than what you can if you physically own them. There's flexibility. When we're sizing up servers uh, to put on a premises, then we have to look, what's the expected lifetime of the server? Over that lifetime, three years, five years, how much workload are we expected going to be on? So then we have to purchase it to cater for the existing workload for the five year lifespan of that computer. When it's in the cloud, you say, well, I need this much for now. And then in six months time, your workload goes up, you just increase what you're renting off the cloud. And then you increase it, then it goes down. You get post Christmas, that's how you drop it down. So there's a lot more flexibility in the cloud resources and you can just take what you need, when you need it, and leave the rest on the table. So that your overall costs are then reduced. And a lot of people just find it simpler because you've just got one bill, one person looking after things, and all you have to worry about is not turning the power on, not getting the dust out of the, uh, the, the computers itself into the uh, mice or anything like that. You just use it. So that's a lot simpler. So there are some of the advantages of using the software which is relocated into the cloud even though it does exactly the same thing. But not only that, there are some things which have been reinvented. So they're the same things that you're used to, 
but they have got a little bit of a twist to them and do the same sort of things in a different way. One of the easiest things to understand is a uh, word processor. I'm sure everybody's used a word processor these days. But when we put a word processor in the cloud, we can get two, three, four, five people all working on the same document at the same time. So we have reinvented the word processor. And a lot of people think, isn't that confusing? Well, when you have the need for people to be working on the same document, it's usually because each of them have got expertise in different areas. So they're all contributing to it, whatever that is, whether it's a tender or it's a policy document, whatever it is. And people tend to be working in different parts of the document, so it all comes together. But you can get multiple people working at the same time, and you can see that working exactly that way. Storage. You put a file onto a disk, um, and it's there. You uh, do some work, you rewrite it. Do some work, rewrite it. Do some work, rewrite it. We put it into the cloud, we'll all of a sudden get version control added to it for free. So if you write onto that file, then somebody else writes into it, that becomes a new version. And you can see that, and you can track back through that. So these are the sorts of things which are reinvented. Then we have some things which are just totally rebuilt. I mentioned before about mobile phones. A lot of uh, larger offices now are using VoIP phones, voice over IP. Prior to VoIP, your phone system was limited to your office. If you had branch office, you could get a very expensive trunk line to join the two offices together. With VoIP, that's just gone completely. Because using a VoIP phone, it uses the internet as a communication media. So again, anywhere you have connection to the internet, you have connection to your network. So that allows you to get PABX technologies, call diversion, group pickups, all of those sorts of things, redirected to your existing mobile phone. So these are areas where the technology has been totally redesigned and reworked. So this is what we look at when we get into the cloud and change things around. Well, that answers the what question, what's in there. And that's an interesting subject, but it's one of those so what subjects when it comes to small business, because the real question is, what are you going to do with it? Through there. How are we going to use that as business people? Now, I can't answer the question. I don't know enough about you. I don't know enough about your business to know how you're going to use it. So my first statement is if you are coming across somebody that says, do this X, Y, Z, be careful. Because they're going to apply a cookie cutter approach and there are lots of people who are just out for your money and apply that cookie cutter approach and say, this is the way to go. There is one company I'm very notorious for saying, using the phrase, world's best practice. And all that is is a uh, sales and marketing uh, arm twister to say, if you're not using our system and doing the way things that we do it, you're, you're not doing the world's best practice, so therefore you're doing it wrong. That's not right. You have your own competitive advantage. You have your own way of doing things. You need to work out what makes sense to you. But you do need to learn from what's going with others. So my first point with knowing what to use in the cloud is to get back to basics. What are your business goals? As a business, what are you trying to achieve? As we heard this morning, what is your purpose? And then focus on that. And avoid the herd syndrome. I have seen too many times uh, people saying they want this technology because all their friends are using it. And when they actually get it in, it becomes a white elephant because they don't know what to do with it. Now, Learn from what other people are doing. There are definite lessons to be learned from that, but think about it. Don't just take X, Y, Z from that environment, put it into your environment and expect the same results. The environment has changed. It's your environment, not theirs. So understand what it is that makes it work in that environment and then extract that and put it into your context. Work it through from there. Next thing, and we haven't got into technology yet, 
know your procedures. So you've got your goals, but how do you put those, uh, the way you get to those goals in practice? What do you actually do to get your money in through the door? What do you actually do to get to your customers and give them what they need? Understand those procedures. You know, in corporate days, um, I would study those with the company for uh, yeah, quite some time. I would then get all of the people together in a room, hopefully line them up around the, the boardroom table in the sequence of the product or service flow through there. And we would start from the beginning and say, we do this, then we do this, then we do this. And in always, without fail, before we were even halfway around the process, somebody over there would say, oh, is that how we do that? Because the full process is not understood. Now, in small businesses, that's uh, not going to happen because we have that process within a small number of people. But what does happen is we make assumptions. Because we're dealing with it all of the time, there are things that we gloss over and forget about. There's that Pareto rule. You know the Pareto principle? 80% uh, of your work comes from 20% of your cases. Well, from my point of view, I look at the reverse Pareto because all of the problems come from those 80% of the situations you do 20% of the time. And they're the things that you need to consider and to really understand. But look at that. What are your procedures? When you know your procedures and how they flow through the company, then you can go to the cloud technologies and say, well, this will work, this won't work, and you'll have a reason for it. You won't be following the herd. You won't be saying, this sounds good, and just go and do it anyway. So, Oops, wrong way. The next thing is to do a risk assessment. And I need to emphasise assessment. We have so many things which pass for a risk assessment which are just risk identification. I found this could be a problem, this could be a problem, this could be a problem, and all of a sudden we're jumping at shadows trying to make everything perfect. An assessment says this is a problem, what is the likelihood of that happening? What is the damage if it happens? What are the consequences? What are the ways that we get around to stop it from happening? And when we understand that, we can handle it a bit better. Uh, one of the graphs that we draw just says high probability, low probability versus uh, yeah, low impact and high impact. So if we have something with a high impact but low probability, you know what we do? we get insurance. And that's not necessarily the car insurance or the house insurance, but uh, it could be the backups. So you say a, f a server falling over, that might occur once every 10 years. But I'll take a backup just in case. So you're not going to stop the server from falling over, but you, when the server falls over, you had the backup to cover it. So that's your insurance type risk coverage. So you need to understand that and work through that and that way you will know what things you need to work through and which ones are important to deal with and ones you can just say the cost of preventing them is more than the actual cost of the risk itself and just run with it. But I really have a bee in my bonnet because I see so many people just identifying a risk and trying to stop everything from happening and they're just causing themselves more trouble than they need to. Lastly, when we're dealing with the cloud, your data is leaving your control. That, that's one of the, the defining qualities of the cloud because you don't have it anymore. So do your security assessment on there as well. Similar to your risk assessment, but what's the security required for all of your data? Now, if you've got photos of uh, last year's staff barbecue, does it really matter who gets to see them? Maybe if it does matter, they shouldn't be anywhere at all. But, but understand that as well. What is the security risk which are involved in there? And again, we're getting everybody saying, I want to put security on everything and just tighten the uh, screws down on everything. That is not required. Just put security on what you need to put security on and then leave it off for everything else. Now, while I'm on the subject of that, I'll probably get to it a bit later if I get reminded, but there is something called two-factor authentication. Do I have... No, I don't have a phone somewhere. It's okay. Um, 
everybody knows the concept these days of a user ID and a password. And you type your user ID in, they ask your password, and if that's approved, then it goes through. There is a third level uh, that you can enter in. And uh, who's had one of those uh, bank dongles that have got some rotating numbers on it? That's the most common form of two-factor authentication. In other words, it's something you are, which is your name, something you know, which is your password, and something you have, which is those rotating numbers. And if somebody is to break uh, into your system, knowing your name and your password is pretty easy, particularly if you have a corporate type email account, which is uh, quite often first name dot last name at XYZ Corp. Your password can be cracked. I have had to bypass passwords in a few different ways, but I bypassed them and can, I could break into uh, a, um, a Windows machine in about a quarter of an hour when your back's turned. So it doesn't take long to do it. Professionals that do that, they can crack passwords all over the place and they just know how to get around it. So don't consider your password as being super secure. But if you have stuff which you really need to protect, get this second factor coming into play. Because if somebody wants to crack into your bank account, they will need your name, your password, and the second factor, the rotating passwords, or whatever it is. Now, uh, your Google have got an authenticator which does this. Microsoft have got another version of the authenticator. And what you literally do with these places is register that so that when you go through and you log in, you have your name, your password, and the uh, verification code, or whatever the second factor is. Now you can understand from that, three factors, three things you've got to do, that just gets in the way. And people don't like doing that, particularly if you've got staff, that, they, that gets out of the way. So that's why you look at, what do I really want to protect like that? Don't put it on everything. So, There are things that you also need to consider in the other direction. These are things that you would not, would stop you from putting things in the cloud. Is your networking capability able to cover that? Because you're going to be transferring lots of information over your secure lines. Now, can your internet network handle it? Is your data secure enough? We've spoken about that. Last one, and one that very few people actually think about, is the legal jurisdiction. Hands up those who knows where their data is stored when you put it on Google Drive or when you put it on Facebook. No one, because they won't tell you. So that means your data could be stored anywhere in the world. If it's over in the US, and it's subject to the Patriot Act, not to the Australian laws. If it's over in Singapore, it's subject to Singapore laws, etc. And just recently, over in Europe, the laws have been passed there that they cannot store data over in the US because it doesn't meet EU requirements. So you need to think about what your legal ramifications are if your data ever got into those awkward type situations. So, moving on from there, there are a number of scenarios that may work. I've mentioned about people editing a document. Um, that can be very, very useful if you're putting together a policies document, if you're putting together a, um, a, a tender, or if you're putting together a project where you've got lots of people working on things. And the cloud particularly is very good with that when you have these people in different organisations or different geographies, because you don't need to be in the one room. You just put the document together in the one file and you can get to it. Off-site backup. What would happen if uh, a fire went through your place? Would your backups come back up? Or would your backups go down with your servers in the fire? A lot of small businesses, they take a backup and uh, put the, uh, the media that they keep the backup on in the same place as the computer. So if there's any physical damage, they're all likely to go together. So the cloud is a good way to get an off-site backup. Email on multiple devices. Who's got email on their desktop? Who's got email on their tablet? Who's got email on their phone? And get tired of reading email three or four times over. Right? 
get it onto a cloud server. Yeah, that's a no-brainer because email is already in the cloud. So whatever's there, it's already insecure. So just get it onto a cloud server, you deal with it once on one device, and you see it reflected the same wherever you are. It's just a no-brainer, that one. You're change I've got my notes changing load patterns, which is just tech speak for when you get more times and less times, yet less usage on there. We have mentioned that before. The cloud handles that easily because you are renting time on a computing resource. And you just rent what you need and then hand the rest back. So it reduces your costs very quickly. Another big area, uh, those who have been around to our stand would have seen the video cameras that have been up. We are now finding a lot of our clients doing communications internally and with their clients yeah, using the likes of uh, Skype and um, or YouTube, etc. Uh, Real-time videos, and there's a lot to be gained from that. So that's another way that the cloud has changed and redefined things. So there are some things to look at some things to understand about what you may do. Now, while I've given you those suggestions about things you can do, what is important that you look at your business? Which one do those apply to you? Because I am sure that uh, you wouldn't um, have a business which would use client communications, uh, doing all that sort of thing, uh, well, unlikely in the people I've come across. If you did that, you probably wouldn't also have the need to uh, have your files in the cloud but when you have uh, big contracts being put together. Just doesn't seem to happen in a small business. But it might be possible, but not often. So we need to think carefully about how we put it into play.